So here I am out at uh, March Field, March Air Reserve Base now as it is known, and the museum out here. A bunch of uh, aircraft of different vintages. We have a service dog memorial acknowledging all the dogs that have served in the military. And we have the Dis National Distinguished Flying Cross Memorial. The Freedom Shrine. There's the service dog memorial, complete with tiles that uh, people have obtained to commemorate service dogs or their own dogs in the memory of those that have served our country. And then we have this section, which is a freedom patio, so to speak, with names of folks who want to uh, pay their respects to those that have served our country. And that's a memorial to uh, Jimmy Doolittle. This is called the B-29. And this is a type of airplane that was responsible for the damage in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, built by Boeing. We manufactured 3,950 of these aircraft. Four radial engines on them. Each one's rated about 3,500 horsepower apiece. Um, typically five guys up in the front to do the flying. They have a look master to take care of the bombs here in those two bomb bay doors. You have two side gunners here on the side where the next glass thing is, and then as well as a tail gunner that has to sit way back at the back end of the airplane. So whenever they would go out on these bombing missions during the South Pacific primarily, they would sometimes go out in flights of four, sometimes flights of six, sometimes flights of eight. It just depends on where they were at, what they were doing, and then how critical the mission was to get done. So they would, everybody had to be on their alert for watching the bad guys come out from the left and the right. Everybody had to be staff, uh, manning the gun, so to speak, to watch out, watch out for the bad guys. And then there was certain areas, as they had the staffing, where the red tails would come up in their P-51s and, and fly in cover for them on the right side and left side of the formation to kind of shush off the bad guys. Off your right side, this is called a fire base. So fire base was a very common site in the Vietnam days. Some of them were a little bit smaller than this, some a little bit bigger. But this is kind of an average size fire base. So this was a place where the helicopters could come and land and get not have to get tied up on the main runway where the jets were and things like that. So let's say if they had to have some small amount of maintenance done, they had mechanics nearby where they could do some to work on the helicopters. They could drop off passengers, we can pick up passengers, they can have briefings, all kinds of little logistical things can happen in a fire base. So some of the helicopters that we have uh, stationed here is the one in the foreground here is called the UH-1 UE. And so it was a very uh, very popular workhorse type thing, especially in the Vietnam days. Yep. And so it could be set up as a gunship. They could put uh, mortars, they could put cannons, they could put rifles, uh, machine gunners and stuff like that. So they would basically take off the doors off the side of the helicopter and they would put it like a perch type thing so the guy would have to sit on that way he could look down at his targets and all the bad guys that he was shooting at from up above. Uh, the other kind of mode of operation that you would see during that time period was uh, medevac so they could put approximately three to four stretchers in the back end of that thing and then transport the, the wounded people or the sick people who they needed to get to some medical attention at a bigger uh, medical facility. So the time speed on this helicopter is about 100 miles an hour, 110 miles an hour and uh, there was a lot of, it's still in use today, not as nearly as much as it was back in the 60s and 70s, but there's still a few of them. 
now flying around today. Next funny looking helicopter in the back of that is called an H-21. Paiseki is the name of the manufacturer. Its nickname is called the Flying Banana. And that's just because it has a funny looking body shape there in the back end. So how they come up with that design aerodynamic, I have no idea. But that's what they came out with in the Korean era. And so it was primarily designed as a troop carrier and it can provide rescue missions. They can carry about 16 to 18 troops in the back end of that thing, carry their gear and uh, however they had to, wherever they had to transport the troops to and from different war zones, combat zones. And it was retired based on the Air Force's inventory back in the late 60s. Welcome to Firebase Romeo Charlie here at March Field. It's a uh, replication of a Vietnam era fire base or helicopter base where they could do light repairs and storage of aircraft. positions on it to help, help protect the airplane when it's out on its during its bombing thing. So they would have what they call the chin gunner down there at the bottom of the thing with a little gray uh, deal is on the bottom of the nose. They would have the nose gunner, they would have a top gunner sitting on top of the cockpit. They would have two waist gunners on the uh, on the sides of what we'll see the plastic or excuse me the uh, glass doors over here in a second. You'd have the ball turret operator out sitting down on his rear end down here on the bottom of the thing so he could spin left and right, up and down, and looking for the bad guys. And then the old lucky person that had to be the tail gunner. He had to go all the way back there in the back of that thing and sit down sometimes for two hours, three hours at a time, just looking out for bad guys while they were out doing bombing missions. So very confining type quarters, very claustrophobic inside that thing. Time speed wise, they can travel over 230 to 7 miles an hour, just depends on what kind of hearing or that. There are six of these still flying around the world today, they're owned by private corporations, and at the time of the year, they'll fly to different cities around the United States and kind of give on the spot tours, uh, both the static tours as well as flying tours of these particular airplanes every day. The remaining airplanes that came back from World War II from the United States were melted down from their scrap metals. They were taken to Walnut Ridge, Arkansas, and Kingman, Arizona, and they were melted down to the scrap. So that would be 17 production alone. They had 12,000, excuse me, uh, 76 million tons of aluminum ingots that were extracted from the long-range bomber that the United States ever had. It's powered by six engines. It's got one on each uh, on each wingtip, and then it's got two on the insides by the fuselage. And it's got 1,700 gallon external fuel tanks on each side of the wings. And here comes your big tanker off to your right side. You're on the approach. You can see that. You can see that big boom tail looking thing up there at the tail end of it. We'll see another one here in a few seconds, but that's what he's out here practicing right now. So they Currency and training pilots doing all kinds of different training maneuvers locally. So the B-47 came out in the late 40s, retired back in the late 50s. We manufactured about 2,100 of them. Um, they can drop bombs, they can carry nukes, they can carry missiles, all kinds of different things. Has roughly a 4,000 mile range on it, can be refueled not. It can be refueled mid-air if necessary. Roughly 600 miles an hour at top speed. And Bomb-wise, I think it can carry about 20,000 pounds of bombs. So after that airplane was retired, then the B-52 came out, and they were designing it back in the mid-50s. I think the first one came out in about 1957. And so between 58 and 62, they manufactured about 750 of these B-52s. And so that was 
Back then, there are, all, there are only 76 of them still flying around the world today. They're stationed in Minot, North Dakota, in Barksdale, Louisiana, and they're not scheduled to go out of service until 2040. So they're powered by eight engines. There's two engines in each one of these pods. They have 3,000 gallon external fuel tanks. They keep modernizing the engines on them over the years. They put more modern equipment up in the front end of it for, for navigation. The airplane holds the distinction of being able to fly around the world, around the world, which is roughly 25,000 miles. It can make the journey non-stop. It's refueled by a refueling jet four times you can see in front of it. It all takes about six to two hours. Keep the motor with the push a button and wait to switch backwards and travel maximum speed 1,500 miles an hour. And also in that type of bomber, he has the capability with him using ECM, the Electronic Countermeasures Officer. So they can send out the electronic signal and jam uh, enemy communications and radar. There's various types of engines that we collected over the time period. Here's a 28-cylinder radial engine here in the, in the first engine. So you figure when you got to do a tune-up to one of those, it requires two spark plugs per cylinder. So each engine requires 56 spark plugs just to tune it up. <laughs> So back in that day, they had to do a lot of tuning up. They, that particular air, that particular engine was used on the B-50, the B-36, as well as the KC-97. And the little airplane to your left, this is called an A-26 Invader, built by Douglas. And so this is a unique type of airplane. It saw action in Korea, as well as Vietnam, and World War II. So it was quite an avid, uh, served a lot of roles, I should say. Attacking and bombing. There's a C 141 Star Lifter. And a DC 4, like the ones they used in the Berlin Airlift.